series of 2018. Um, also sending greetings from the CAFID Learning and Sharing Committee, uh, which I have the, the pleasure of uh, working with a, a few of our CAFID members on um, in the design and production of these webinars. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be able to put these out uh, as one of the core offerings of the CAFID uh, network to its members and really grateful that you could uh, you could join us at any point during the webinar if you have any technical difficulties please feel free to email me um, I believe uh, anyone on this would have received the calendar invitation from myself so you can respond to that and, and send me an email if you're having any issues also in that invitation was my mobile telephone number uh, and you're welcome to send me an SMS if you have any challenges I'm just going to do a few very quick housekeeping points here and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, to our terrific panel who we're all here to here today to hear from um, so by way of housekeeping, um, those of you familiar with Skype for Business um, probably don't need this reminder. Um, we like to use Skype for Business because it's one of the most inclusive technology platforms that seems to give us the least challenge on uh, and work the, on the greatest number of devices and around the world. So um, this is our decision to use this platform, and, and I think it's going to work well for us today. For those of you who are joining from your computer or from an, uh, from another device that um, has you using either the app or the web interface, you should see that you've got a chat window available. Throughout the course of the conversation, if you'd like to ask any questions of our panelists, please feel free to insert those into the chat window. If you're joining by telephone or if that chat window is giving you any trouble, please feel free to send me an email with your question. I'll keep a, keep a monitoring on my email and we'll insert that question for you. So questions via the chat window. And then a second point I mentioned a, a minute ago, um, I, I just ask everyone as a courtesy to please make sure your microphones are muted. Um, there is a function that I have that allows me to mute everyone. Um, but in doing so, I risk also muting our panelists. And I, I think we would all agree that's a, a technology failure we want to avoid. So I'm just going to ask each, each and every person individually if you could go ahead and make sure that your microphones are muted. Um, I think almost everyone is. We're getting one or two people with a little bit of background noise. Um, so appreciate your cooperation on that. And then a, a final point, as I mentioned, with these webinar series, um, this is a core feature of the CAFID um, schedule of events for 2018. If through the course of today or afterwards you have any inspiration or thoughts on future webinars, content, speakers, approaches, etc., uh, we'd very much like to hear that from you on the Learning and Sharing Committee. So please feel free to send me an email uh, with any thoughts or recommendations. And just before I turn it over to Yana um, as our, our um, terrific moderator today to get us going, I'd like to ask everyone to reflect on one question. And if you have the ability with the chat window to provide us a thought, we would love to hear from you in terms of given your knowledge of the impact investing and development finance and emerging markets space in Canada, what, what topic is front of mind for you today? In other words, what brought you to CAFID and what brought you to the webinar today? If you could put a, a sentence or two about that into the chat window, um, we're going to try to, to react to that in real time and make sure that our panelists and our moderator are able to steer the conversation in that direction. So what, what's an issue that brought you to our webinar today with regards to the, the history, the evolution, or the current state of impact investing in emerging markets from Canada? Great. And with that, I'm going to take my own advice. I'm going to put myself on mute and turn things over to our, uh, first off, to our moderator, Yana, um, for a quick introduction, and then um, to take us through the first part of the conversation with our panelists. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Ten. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yana Svadova. I'm based at the University of British Columbia, where I manage a newly created impact fund. Um, I do also have a lot of background in um, specifically this area in terms of investing for international development. I uh, did a lot of work in Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of that did involve working with the Australian government and some of the new initiatives that they had. So this webinar is also, uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussions here as well. 
Um, I think we'll get uh, started with just brief introductions to our panelists um, for those of you who don't um, aren't as familiar with their work. So I'll just ask um, our panelists to give a quick introduction to who they are, um, a little bit about their organization, and the same question that, um, that Ted asked of all the participants, what is an issue um, in this space that is uh, either really exciting for you right now or keeping you awake at night. So it would be great if we could start with you, Marisol. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, do you hear me well, Jenna? Uh, I can hear you, yes. Okay. Okay. So thanks thanks for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here with you today. Um, to, uh, to introduce myself, I have uh, many years of experience in the Desjardins group, uh, but specifically within the ID, Développement International Desjardins where primarily as a financial inclusion expert, uh, I supported different types of financial institutions in developing countries to improve their practices, uh, methodologies, and their performance, and uh, to help them to expand financial inclusion. So DID works to improve access to a diverse range of well-adapted and safe uh, financial services for disadvantaged communities to, through uh, two levers. Uh, we provide technical assistance, and we do make investments. So those two levers are the way we uh, realize our, our mission. Uh, I have to say that we are first and foremost uh, a consultant, uh, kind of a project manager in the financial inclusion sector. But in the late uh, 90s, we started not only advising our partners, but also providing them uh, with financial resources. Um, today, I am in charge of uh, developing the investment strategy and managing the investment team at DID. We do manage uh, two mixed funds, so debt and equity, uh, that aim to the uh, financial sector in emerging markets. So we promote the development of viable inclusion, inclusive financial institutions, and we promote uh, access to uh, quality financial services for an underbanked uh, population. Uh, with the goal of fostering economic growth and uh, create, uh, creating jobs. We are a really modest investor, I would say. We currently manage around uh, 20 investments, uh, mainly direct investment in the financial institutions. So it comes from Ecuador or Colombia to uh, Tajikistan via Zambia or Tunisia. So our goal is to support these institutions to deploy um, specialized financial solution in underserved market or clientele, they are usually reluctant to go into or to address. So uh, I'm, I can give an example of agribusiness sector, women uh, or entrepreneurs. So usually financial institutions are really reluctant to go into those sectors. So uh, with the investment we make uh, to them, we try to uh, attract them in those uh, sectors. So I think I will stop here for now. Great. Thanks, Marisol. Um, Gerhard, if we could move to you next um, for your introduction. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Um, glad to join you here. If there's a little bit of background noise when I speak, I'm um, perched in a corner of a hotel lobby here. Uh, so uh, pardon the, the background noise uh, as it comes on and off. Um, yes. So. I've been involved in the, I guess, the impact investment sector for, oh, I don't know, in emerging markets for 30 years, um, began doing uh, impact investment uh, work probably 25 years ago when I discovered MEDA and uh, took over responsibility for MEDA's investment portfolio and began building some investment funds around that uh, in the intervening years. Um, we created Microvest Capital Management, which was focused on microfinance, and of course, um, the Serona Group of Funds, which uh, we we spun off Serona Asset Management in 2010, I believe it was, so eight years ago now. Um, Serge joined me before that, um, so we've been uh, it's now private equity, mostly in the small to mid market space, um, investing private capital into emerging market funds. We used to do all direct debt and equity. Now it's been uh, primarily investing in local private equity funds across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. 
and it's uh, it's the 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 interest in investing the the interest on the on the part of investors private investors to invest in those markets has grown significantly over the 25 years I've been involved in this um, the perceived risk by the Oh, sounds like we're losing you a little bit, Gerhard. Okay, it sounds like you might be having some trouble with with your connection. Um, maybe we'll we'll move on to David, uh, David, for your introduction and see if we can get Gerhard back. Great. Yep. Thank you, Anna, and uh, and special thanks also to Ted for pulling all this together. I know it's you make it sound easy, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot to it. Um, so my story is uh, I started uh, traveling and doing business around primarily Asia in the late 80s and 90s uh, and, uh, and throughout Eastern Europe when it started to open up and then Africa uh, sort of towards the late 90s. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, what was so exciting and the reason that I have gone into the space, which we'll, we'll call impact now, it used to be just um, development finance, um, was just the, the the demographics, the kinetic energy of what was going on on the ground, the desire of these people to move forward, and just the, the size of the populations uh, in comparison to what was going on in the West. So I came back to my hometown of Montreal uh, in 2000 and uh, in order to get Cordian off the ground with my old partner, Carl Otto, um, so we uh, we did that for a number of years. Uh, I have since uh, left Cordiant and am now focusing on really just using uh, a lot of the knowledge and experience and contacts and so on that I built up over the years. Um, so I, I know Chris Club is on the line. I'm a director of Convergence, uh, working with Impia on their private credit council and as a senior advisor. So. A number of different initiatives where uh, I can put a lot of this stuff to use, and I think, and, and we'll get into this a little bit more as, uh, as the, the, we go through the discussion. But uh, you know, I, I think this whole concept of blended finance is going to be the catalyst that really moves the private sector into the development finance impact space. And um, you know, I mean, I have spoken to I don't know how many, probably a thousand institutional investors around the world. I've been able to convert, uh, you know, maybe a dozen or, or maybe 25 or so of them to become investors in some of the activities that we've done, both private credit and private equity. But the rest of them are all just sort of sitting there going, you know, I just don't get it. Uh, I, I don't understand. The risk-return profile is, uh, you know, is, is not where it should be or whatever. I mean, I've, I've heard every excuse that there is. And so what we need to do is find ways to be able to get them off their seat in order to be able to move those billions to trillions, as we say, for the sustainable development goals. So, you know, that's what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on now and uh, still very much involved um, and look forward to sharing my thoughts as we go through today's webinar. Great. Thanks so much, David. Um, I think all of you um, have been in the space for, um, you're quite seasoned in the space, and uh, Gerhard touched on this briefly. It's really changed a lot um, in the last 10, 15, 15 years. I'd love to, to ask you on, um, from your perspective, when, when you started in the space and started with, the the with this thesis that investing could um, investing in emerging markets could have significant development outcomes and that private capital could be um, invested for financial and development objectives as well. Um, do you think this this idea has caught on in the time you've been working in a space? Um, how have you seen seen that catch on? Um, and any any significant um, developments that you think had most uh, most impact on this idea and others getting on board. I mean, I think even even seven years ago, we probably wouldn't get this many people on a webinar um, interested in talking about this. Um, and maybe, Gerhard, if you are, uh, if we can hear you, maybe I'll try starting with you to see if you're back on the line as well. 
Yes, yes, Yana. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure what the problem is. I'm just uh, beside the White House here, and maybe they're they're, they're killing the the lines, um, which I doubt. Um, but the to to your point, it might be related to the to the fact that I'm beside the White House here because I've just been meeting with uh, representatives of the U.S. government. Um, one of the big things that's changed, Yana, I think, is the uh, is the the change in attitude between or of the public sector towards the private sector. It's uh, for for me in my career one 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 of the biggest changes I've seen over this time. Um, for the last 75 years since the world wars, uh, since the Bretton Woods uh, institutions were built up, um, the private sector was seen as the problem to development. And it's only in recent years, it's only in the last 10 years, maybe the last five years, that the public sector has increasingly seen the private sector not as the problem, but as an integral part of the solution to development. And um, at the same time, the private sector, not just in the impact in the investment industry, the private sector broadly, certainly the global corporates, have increasingly recognized their responsibility for social and environmental impact, not just for shareholder value. And those two sides coming together, the private sector um, beginning to take increased responsibility for their actions and the public sector trusting the private sector to be a partner of theirs, that gives us this massive, this great opportunity, this unique time in history where we can we can work together to build a, a stronger economy. And so that, for me, I think, Yana, is the biggest change that I've seen um, in the whole investing in emerging markets or the impact investing space over the last 25 years. Great. And Marisol, from, from your perspective, um, what would your perspective be on that? And I'm also curious about how with, with your work has, has that, has, has the focus or where you guys have been focusing changed a lot, um, over the past? In fact, uh, it is interesting, uh, to know the way we started investing in emer emerging market, uh, because it has been, um, led by two phenomena that, that led us to consider making investment in the financial inclusion, inclusion sector. Like I said, it was late in the, in the 90s. Um, the first thing is that, uh, we saw the kind of a commercialization of microfinance, uh, for a lot of stakeholders. Uh, microfinance has appeared to be interesting and attractive from a business point of view. So with over 70% of the uh, population unbanked in developing countries, some uh, saw a, a huge potential market to develop and to exploit. Um, but for the ID, the main, the main point uh, or, or why we started to invest in uh, developing countries, it mainly originated from re requests from our partners, um, financial institutions we were supporting and working with. So they were telling us, uh, look, the ID, we, we value your advice, your technical support, and um, the capacity development activities you, you carry on, but in order to scale and implement or deploy what you have developed with us, and if we want to grow, uh, we will need financial support, financial resources. So we will need capital as much as technical support. So this is why we started to consider to offer financial resources to our partners. Um, I remind that um, for us, developing countries were not uh, a new playground for us. Uh, we already had, at that time, we already had a long track record in more than um, 40 countries uh, from which we had already a good knowledge of. Uh, but investment was new. Uh, we were providing advice. We were providing technical support, technical expertise from Desjardins to local financial institutions. So at uh, this moment, we were then asked to take another type of risk. Um, in fact, we were told, put your skin in the game, guys. Um, and this was a new job for us. Um, but I would say that our competitive edge was our more than 40 years of experience in the financial sector of developing countries. So we learned uh, that new job uh, of being an investor and a fund manager. And uh, we developed this new business model while the industry was also emerging. So we contribute to many different initiatives in order to share, but also to learn from others. So different, different types of events happened along the way. Uh, for instance, we, we started, first of all, we started investing through funds in order to learn and to network with the, uh, the investors community. 
Um, but we also took advantage of the, uh, I would say, the appearance of products or mechanism of risk mitigation. Uh, to name a few, uh, there, there were a, a political risk insurance, a product offered by EDC. Uh, we used it. Um, there, there's been also a launch of uh, currency edge funds, uh, TCX and MFX um, currency edge funds that we, we have been using as well. Uh, in 2003, uh, we contributed to the creation or the launching of uh, the CMEF, which is the Council of Microfinance Equity Fund, now known as the uh, Financial Inclusion Equity Council. So all all these events or these uh, these uh, yeah these events allowed us to build a strong investment thesis to build uh, our track record and become a relevant although really modest uh, player in the in the emerging market impact investment even even before impact investing was named like that actually yeah that's actually yeah even a more recent more recent development even having a name for this. Uh -huh. um, and, and David, from your perspective, what are some of the highlights that you've seen in terms of how, how the sector has developed and how has that changed uh, what you do and your approach? Do we have you there, David? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, oh. uh, I guess uh, looking back at the history books, um, in the 90s, you had some pretty scandalous activities with Nike and their operations in Indonesia. Um, and the World Trade Organization was sort of the place where the, you know, the, the, the people who were upset with globalization and uh, investment in the emerging markets um, um, were in a position to be able to vent their, their concerns. And you were just saying that um, you, know, you started getting the, the creation of, uh, of different groups such as uh, the Responsible Investment and SIO, the Social Investment Organization, TBLI, the Triple bottom line investing, UNPRI, GI, and, uh, GIN, and, uh, you know, everybody's talking about ESG and, and all these things. So, you know, while I think that's good and it just raises the profile and everybody begins to understand what the need is, again, going back to the institutional investors, um, I don't think we're seeing the big money yet. So, you know, the Scandinavian and, uh, and Dutch pension funds were um, sort of early adopters of this whole movement. And, you know, they would put all over their, their websites that they've been supporting solar uh, power and wind and, uh, and various other initiatives. But it wasn't really the big money. The big money was really just focused on their primary objective, which was their fiduciary duty to their stakeholders. And that's a shift that is slow to happen and slow to come, but it is happening. And I think as we as we get further uh, down the road of, sort of thinking about this panoply of different um, groups that are all basically trying to talk about the same thing, which is essentially just responsible investment, you see that it is no longer um, being focused on by you know, the equivalent of an, of an internal auditor at uh, an investment firm or at uh, an institutional investor, um, that it is now something that is becoming very much in the DNA and the mainstream thinking of investors. So it's not something that you do just on the side because you want to be nice and you want to be seen to be doing positive things, but the whole concept of responsible investing and, and you know, whatever – element it is uh, of that that we're we're talking about is becoming just the way you do business it's not uh, it's not a, a subset of that and that I think is fabulous it, again it's slow to come we are at a tipping point I think right now and it's a slow tip but it is happening and I think you will start to see and again you know the blend of finance may well be the thing that really gives it that that goose and, and gets the big money in but that's that's an exciting time to be involved in all this well, that actually um, leads into into my next question. So maybe David, uh, I can also get your perspective um, perspective on that. Um, you you and Gerhard, you know, both mentioned that there there is more money coming into this space. Um, different players are are seeing this as something that they can engage with. Um, but obviously, we still need a lot more capital to 
um, you know, they, they put out the number about how much capital would be uh, needed to address the SDGs. We know it's a lot more than just the traditional development finance, and we see some of that private sector funds coming into, into the space and making a contribution, but we clearly need a lot more. And so um, based on what you were just talking about, um, what, what do you see as some of the barriers to catalyzing even more um, private capital uh, toward investing for development? And any thoughts from your perspective on how what could help catalyze that? You know, one of the uh, one of the issues, and I've had this conversation, it's sort of a, a bit of a pet project of mine, of a uh, of a, a large Swiss insurance company that I've been speaking to for a very long time, and you know, we we run through, and, I, and I'd say they're pretty representative of, of quite a few similar. Um, institutional investors and you know so the, the first thing that they're looking for is data they want to be able to see how for example uh, infrastructure debt has performed over the past 10 years and the fact is you know that data is not available um, it's being built up and prequin has been good enough to start to to um, include that in their uh, in their uh, research so that's you know, one thing that just gives people comfort. And then secondly, um, you know, you just need more people talking about it. Um, and as that happens, it becomes socialized, it becomes uh, it becomes acceptable, it's not quirky and something on the sidelines, it's just something that you do. And, you know, dangling very basic um, data, such as the percentage of GDP that's in the emerging markets versus the developed world, uh, really does focus the mind for investors and, uh, uh, and you know, essentially, I mean, as I've said to a couple of them, they say, yeah, we're, we're really uh, excited. We've got 15% of our portfolio in emerging markets. And I say, well, so you're shorting the emerging markets because uh, the market weight should be 50%. And uh, they, they sort of stand back and, and wonder about the logic of that. But it's it's very simple, and that's really where they should be. Um, and, and I think they'll be moving in that direction. Um, one of the things that, that uh, from a Canadian perspective, on you know how they have been involved. I mean, two G8s ago at the Kananaskis meeting um, under uh, Kretchen, they had the, the foresight to put together this five hundred million dollar Canada Fund for Africa, which was you know very far ahead of its time, and I, um, and, and I had the luck of being able to manage. A portion of that, which became SIFA, the, the Canada Investment Fund for Africa, which is focused on private equity, and a very early form of sort of blended finance, we uh, we used the, the government of Canada's capital um, in a slightly subordinated way in order to attract in private sector investors, and it worked out really well from everybody's perspective. Um, but the, the problem is when that fund came to an end, that was considered to be the old government's. Uh, um, activity and so the, the money that was paid back just went straight into the consolidated revenue account and never to be seen again. So, you know, it it takes a, uh, it, it takes a long view from all participants, whether they be the aid agencies, the uh, you know the the institutional investors, to just appreciate the the, the uh, you know how this is all going to unfold. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, uh, countries uh, sort of race ahead as Brazil did, and then they sort of take a couple steps back as they're doing now, and then you know they will get going again, and, and that will be a force to be reckoned with. But you know, too many people get a little bit excited about the, the volatility and so on and so forth. So I think the strategy that uh, that they should take is along the lines of what Gerhard is doing, which is taking a very broad range of strategies. Uh, and creating this diversification so that they can have the exposure and, and, you know, at any one point, one country or sector is going to be strong and others maybe not going to be as strong and, and that sort of thing. So, sorry I'm rambling, but it's, uh, you know, again, just thinking about how to get the private sector involved and how governments can act as catalysts. Great. And, Gerhard, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. I know... Um, 
a while back, we once were talking about this topic and talking about also the the difference between how much Canadian uh, um, investors are getting involved versus maybe American investors. So I'd also love to hear your perspective um, on that, especially we we want to talk about the Canadian perspective here. And I think that was that was an interesting thing you mentioned to me before about what you're seeing about um how Canadian investors are getting involved versus versus U.S. investors. Sure, uh, gladly. Uh, thanks, Anna. Um, I, I think you're right. I mean, one one of the things, uh, if you go to the CVCA, the Canadian Venture Capital Association, to one of their meetings, um, and, and and walk around the room and talk to venture capital players in Canada, they all say that they raise their money in America. Um, they cross the border for that. Canadians, and uh, the surprising thing for us has been that um, Canadian investors are uh, are conservative. Um, that's that's fine, but surprising is that Canada is made up of such a uh, diverse uh, cultural mixture. So it's a, this multicultural group of people from all around the world, and yet uh, from an investment investor perspective. Um, Canada remains uh, somewhat uh, conservative in, in terms of taking taking on risks, et cetera, um, going and investing in emerging markets. And often investors will say, this is true around developed markets, investors will will say that, um, will, will wonder whether the uh, financial returns offered by emerging market private equity is um, commensurate with the additional risk they're taking on going into emerging markets. And um, I agree with David. I mean, we we just uh, there's going to need to be more experience, a little bit more um, recording of uh, of in, independent recording of of results. Um, Prequent's going to have to post these kind of results, these benchmarks, um, a little bit longer. But on the other hand, we do have in Canada uh, a government that uh, on February 27th announced one and a half billion for. Um, blended finance and sovereign loan program. I think 873 of that was for, for, for blended finance. Now, there have been the G20 or the G7, uh, have been talking for a lot of government sovereigns have been talking for a long time about blended finance, about catalyzing private capital, about partnering with private sector firms, um, to, to get to augment the flow of private Investment into emerging markets. Yana, you mentioned a, a gap uh, for the SDGs, a funding gap of, I don't know, I think it's, I've seen it between two and five trillion, depending on how you count. Uh, two, two to five trillion per annum uh, shortfall, investment shortfall, if we're going to want to achieve the SDGs. Um, so, well, a lot of governments have talked about uh, catalyzing private capital. Few of them are actually putting any money on the table. Um, and I'm thrilled to see that Canada, for one, is doing that. Now, Canada still hasn't figured out how to get the money off the table, um, but at least they've announced that there's going to be money on the table. Um, one of the frust- great frustrations is that uh, they they don't properly yet know um, how they're going to program uh, or how they're going to catalyze private capital, how they're going to blend their their resources in into the resources of the private sector. Um, once they get that done, I think that'll have a, a significant um, catalytic effect in terms of the flow of private capital. And I think, quite frankly, um, while Canadians might be conservative investors here in this in this realm, Canada has the opportunity to to be the global leader for uh, for for impact investing. Um, can you actually expand on that a little bit? Um, you talked about the, so the money is on the table. We're not sure how it's going to be used yet. You've seen examples of um, what what other governments have been doing. Uh, you think there's an opportunity there for Canada to be a leader. Any thoughts on how Canada could be a leader? Um, well, one of the things, uh, uh, for example, two and a half years ago, um, right after the Liberals were elected, um, Stefan Dion, who was then the Foreign Affairs Minister, announced at the COP meeting a uh, 2.3 billion Canadian investment in climate-focused investments in emerging markets, seeking to catalyze private capital at a 3x or 4x uh, ratio. Um, and then uh, that was a great announcement. It was announced again at Davos, I, I believe, that uh, that January, two years ago. Um, then the government does what it 
so often does, and that uh, do the easy thing. It punts all that money over to the World Bank, IFC, Inter-American Development Bank, etc. Um, and none of that money actually draws any private capital across the ocean with it. So um, if Government Canada takes a $2.3 billion, puts it with the IFC, IFC invests it in renewable energy infrastructure in emerging markets, they invest alongside private capital. But they're not actually building a sustainable capital bridge um, uh, that moves private capital across the ocean from um, capital surplus regions of the world to capital deficit regions of the world. Um, Canada does have the opportunity to become a leader if it is it takes takes some some if it has some courage and actually supports um, private intermediation of capital flows to emerging markets. Impea, where um, David is a is a senior advisor, Impea is an association of emerging market private equity firms and and private debt firms as well. And there's a there's a whole host of good private sector intermediaries that are looking to do the right thing, that are looking to create not just financial returns but also social and environmental positive social and environmental impact. Um, that uh, that Canada could help uh, help to catalyze the 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 greater flow of private capital to to those markets. And so we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone and not just Punt money over to the the multilateral development institutions. We're going to have to support the building of sustainable bridges of private capital flow to those markets. Thanks, Gerhard. Um, and just a quick uh, note to all the participants: we're going to get into a Q and A in just a few minutes. So, if you do have some questions that are coming to mind, feel free to start putting those into the chat window on the left of your screen, um, and then we'll get we'll get into into those shortly. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Marisol, with, with a similar question. I'd love to also hear your views on any best examples that you've seen um, globally that you know you wish you had as a tool in terms of in terms of your work or any thoughts that you have on um, on Canada's role and where Canada really could uh, stand out and do something you know different or or or, uh, or lead with with tools or mechanisms that that others haven't put in place yet yeah. Well, I don't want to be to be rude, but uh, I have to agree with uh, with I think Gerard was saying that uh, Canadians are conservative investors. This is this is true, um, and and I don't think Canada will never be a clear leader in the field of financing the development or in impact investment. I think we have to lower our expectation in this regard. Um, this being said, we have to remember that for Canadians, uh, investing in emerging markets still mean having to accept. Uh, greater volatility, uh, except risk, for sometimes lower than financial returns. Um, to attract private and commercial investors, it is needed to to be able to better mitigate mitigate uh, the risk associated with emerging markets, uh, either currency risk, credit risk, uh, political risk. Uh, if we achieve that with risk mitigation mechanism or instrument, it will become more attracting for for investors. I would say that the, the creation of FinDef Canada, the, the, the Canadian DFI, is, is certainly a first step, um, but that arrives quite late. Um, but well, better late than never. However, I feel that there is still a, a missing gap. Um, since the new, the new DFI, FinDef Canada must target uh, financial self-sufficiency. It has to make a profitable investment. There is a need for, for definitely a need for a blended finance program or schemes. Uh, that could catalyze private sector solution by by mitigating uh, certain risk or underwriting certain risk. I feel there is a kind of a disconnect between the subsidies only approach of Global Affairs Canada and the commercial approach of a DFI. So Global Affairs Canada certainly has a role to play to connect these two worlds. I would say um, uh, GAC could take on additional risk. Um, to illustrate that, I would say that uh, I see DFI investment as being part of a continuum of development tools, ranging, ranging from aid alone to investment alone. Uh, and there can be different combination of aid and investment, uh, and investment in between. Uh, 
um, establishing a DFI could lead sometimes led to the lead to the perception that uh, the government should not engage in any, in any other form of investment or funding for development. So although Global Affairs Canada is not currently enabled to invest in for-profit initiatives, there is some work uh, on the way on that. Um, I do hope to see this possibility in the future. So this will allow for investment in much riskier countries and, and sectors. Um, Another problem we have with uh, with DFI is that um, working with DFI sometimes involves long delays as well as a complicated legal negotiations. So in private equity or in venture capital, uh, everything is about people and timings. So we do invest in people and everything is a matter of timing. So the problem I see uh, when we have um, when we try to close a deal and try to join private and public funds is a problem of pace. Uh, we do not work at the same pace than the government. So it is really challenging to synchronize the, the opportunity, the need, and the offer with, uh, with uh, the right timing. So to overcome this uh, barrier, it will be truly innovative for the Canadian DFI to have a lighter approach, especially for smaller investment. Uh, and this might, might uh, require some out-of-the-box thinking. Yeah, this, this, uh, the DFI uh, being so new, there's a, lo a lot of opportunity. Um, potentially some hesitation thoughts about whether this the opportunity that this new tool brings will be realized. Uh, David and Gerhard, I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. Uh, maybe we'll start uh, with you, David, um, in terms of how you view the, the newly created DFI and the commitment Canada's made um, and, and any thoughts that you have on any other tools or any other uh, mechanisms that would be on your wish list. Um, Sure. Um, well, so this DFI has been in the discussion phase for a very long time. Um, uh, and I'm saying tens, well, actually 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I know Gerhard and I, are, and I have been pulled in a couple of times over the last number of years for consultations on, uh, on what the DFI would look like. And I guess one of the things that we really um, – really tried to leave the government with was that the DFI space is already pretty crowded uh, and that if Canada is to come up with a, a DFI, it should differentiate itself from the, the crowded um, space. So the, uh, the opportunity to be able to, uh, to use this DFI as a window for blended finance I think is really um, the direction that they should be going in. I've had conversations with various people involved, uh, and you know, I, I don't think anybody said that they don't understand what I'm talking about or that it doesn't make any sense, but that they need to get their their feet underneath them first before they can start to uh, to run with something like this. So I live in hope, and uh, because otherwise, I mean, if it's just another DFI partnering on deals with the existing DFI community is really not adding anything to the mix. So um, so there's an opportunity to do something. So with that in mind, uh, one of our good friends within Global Affairs Canada, uh, back in the days when it was DFAT-D, um, wrote a paper called From DFI to BFI, so De Development Finance Institution to Blended Finance Institution, and making a, a strong case for uh, for the fact that the, the DFIs have done a, a tremendous job, um, both uh, bilateral, multilateral development banks, um, over their, let's call it, 50 years, but that uh, for a variety of reasons, blended finance institutions that would be using capital in this catalytic way would be able to take the ball and run it uh, a lot further and a lot faster than would have been done with DFIs. Now, that might just be a, a bit of a dream and, and so on, but the fact is um, a DFI is not the only game in town now. The, uh, the allocation, and uh, we've already mentioned it, but the allocation that was made in the budget for uh, innovative finance and then, uh, and then a separate 
pool was announced uh, up at Murray Bay uh, um, uh, last week or the week before. So, you know, this is something that's very much in the works, and uh, and I'll just reiterate what's already been said. We now need to get it off the table and, and out into the uh, in, into the market, and that is a challenge. And um, I know that the the guys and girls who are working in Ottawa on structuring deals um, and on, on working within blended finance uh, are uh, there are not enough of them. Um, and I think that uh, if you run into anybody that's sort of got a financial mind and a development mind and is looking for a job, I think that, uh, that there'd probably be some openings in Ottawa. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thanks. Uh, Gerhard, what about yourself? Sorry, my call dropped off again. I'm just back on. What was the question? Apologize. Oh, the, so the question was, yeah, I did see you drop off there, but glad, glad you're back. Um, the question was uh, more specifically on the the, re the current DFI sort of being um, a big step for Canada, uh, coming after a lot of a lot of discussion. Uh, just question was around your thoughts on how effective that can be uh, based on the the current needs of the space. And if you had um, a wish list in terms of what else Canada would do, either through through this DFI institution or through another mechanism, uh, what would that be? Right. Um, I've uh, I've, <laughs> I've been on record for undiplomatically saying the best thing the DFI could do is give the money back to the government of Canada and, and shut down. Um, and I and and I and I mean that you know partly tongue in cheek. Um, is, and I, I think simply to reiterate what I heard uh, David say is that if, it's, if the DFI is going to do, in, a, in very small ways, um, what IFC and FMO and CDC and ProParco and everybody else has been doing for the last 30 years, then we're too little too late for the game. If, however, one can learn from the 30 years experience of the other DFIs and do something far more creative more courageous, and Canada's a small town where courage uh, and risk-taking might be encouraged and appreciated. If the DFI did that, um, I think there's uh, there's good potential for Canada to again make its mark um, because it's 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 unburdened by a history or a process or a bureaucracy. The DFI is the Canadian DFI, unburdened by that um, that that same burden that. All the other DFIs now carry with uh, with their 20, 30, or more years of of, of history. I also agree with uh, with with David and the Tom Bowie's paper on uh, from DFI to BFI. Um, brilliant. Um, I I agree. We if our DFI, if our Canadian DFI can become more like a BFI, um, a catalytic FI um, that will catalyze the flow of private capital to emerging markets, not just invest in already uh, structured deals in those in those countries, um, then then I think we can we can make a mark. But in as much as it um, it it just follows in the uh, as a small brother, as a small follower in the footsteps of of what the other DFIs have been doing, then I think um, we will have lost a, a, a great opportunity. Great. And just a quick reminder again, if anybody does have any questions, um, I have seen um, the topic of actually one topic that did come up um, at the beginning from from one of the participants is on impact investing in the Canadian feminist international policy. And I guess a, a broader question, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on um, what your thoughts are on the, the gender lens approach to the impact investing, anything that you're doing um, specifically uh, with your funds or your work, um, and thoughts on, um, and this is a bit recent, there is a question here about uh, the, the DFI's announcement about a focus on, on gender and women. Um, if you are familiar with with what that's going to look like, any thoughts on, again, how whether that is a good step, how effective um, it can be, or whether something else um, is needed. Maybe we'll kick off, go back to go back to you, Marisol. Um, yeah, on the gender gender empowerment strategy that the the minister has put on the table. Yeah, 
Uh, well, both women and men make a considerable contribution to development. However, the, the opportunities and constraints uh, related to development do differ and vary considerably whether one is a man or a woman. Um, probably I don't have to remind anybody that women represent 50% of the population, so I don't think any business will ignore half of its target market. So um, women represent an active force, uh, generate significant impact on the uh, development of their local communities and countries. So as impact investors, uh, I think that we have definitely a role to play to encourage this um, valuable economic contribution that uh, benefits the entire community. Um, Maybe a few uh, a few interesting data. Uh, one is from the uh, from McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey in 2015 they assessed that uh, closing the gap between women and men around the world would add some th some some something like I think it was 12 trillions to the gro global GDP in 2025. So um, this is a good argument to promote a gender empowerment strategy and to use the, the gender lens. Uh, in our investment strategy. Gerhard or David, anything that you would want to add to that? I could, um, I would simply add that uh, I, I think it's, uh, I, I mean, I, we're very supportive of, of gender focused strategies, of gender lens investing, etc. Um, would go, would, would, would encourage though that it that that lens go beyond just thinking about investing in women women led businesses or women owned businesses to encouraging um, or to moving the needle for women's empowerment throughout all businesses. So if we can focus our 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 TA or our influence in the companies that that we invest in or uh, or purchase, if we can move the needle for women, empower women into management, empower women into Governance and maybe into ownership, um, then we will we will have a we we will have done a great thing um, for women's empowerment in, in through our investments in those markets. Another question that um, has come up is around opportunities for investing in early stage infrastructure projects and moving toward investment readiness. And I guess I would actually make that question a little bit broader. We talked about catalyzing more investment funding, but obviously there's always the other side of um, projects being investment ready. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on, on our, are you seeing that there is enough investment ready um, opportunities that are, are investment ready if we're catalyzing more um, more investment funding um, and specifically any thoughts on if if more support or other um, initiatives are needed to help move toward investment um, readiness uh, David uh, could I ask you to kick off with that question yeah sure boy you, you, you're throwing the ball right in my mitt and <laughs> the the current situation is really kind of uh, counterintuitive um, because there is a lot of money that is available for, in particular, power in Africa. So uh, uh, Blackstone put together a $5 billion fund called the Black Rhino. Uh, it's been uh, going for a couple of years. Um, I don't think they've done a single investment yet. The Texas Pacific Group, similar story. Obama's uh, Power Africa, similar story. Um, and so the problem is there are a lot of deals that have gone through the feasibility studies. They might have a power purchase agreement, the concession from the government, and they just run out of steam. Um, they, they, they are not bankable. And so what we need to do, and I've been working with the Canadian government and various others, is back the project developers, and it's a risky business. It's tough, in particular in Africa, in being able to connect all the dots and to get all the, the agreements in place so that you can present the project, uh, and generally a greenfield project, to investors as a project finance um, and, uh, and get the deal done. And the fact is, um, if you are able to put together a deal, they get financed without any problem because the money is there. 
The problem is there aren't enough deals that are actually being taken from feasibility through to bankability. And so uh, I had suggested that the DFI actually back one of these uh, project developers. And what will also happen in that case is that you have a seat at the table while the projects are forming, which means that you can introduce Canadian infrastructure, engineering, uh, con uh, consultants, what have you, into the deal while it's being formed um, rather than waiting until it's actually a bankability and wondering why you missed the boat. So there's a real opportunity there, and uh, I'd love to chat with anybody who'd like to hear more about it because it is one of my main projects right now. Great. Thank you. Um, Ted, I just want to be mindful of time. I think we're getting close to the end, um, the end of the webinar. Did you want to jump in with anything at this point? Any thoughts on um, follow-ups for for the group? Um, whether CAFID will be um, any any other uh, future webinars you want to mention, or anything else from your point before we wrap up? That's great, Yana. Thanks very much, and and again, thanks to to Gerhard, Marisol, and, and David as well for a great conversation and the participation we've had along the way. Uh, it's nice that we're leaving with, I think, a few unanswered questions. That that means that CAFID still has ground to cover and that its members have, have a lot more to talk about. So um, do appreciate everyone's time. Um, stay tuned for details. We'll be doing another webinar uh, in two months, um, and details on that will be coming out soon. Um, I did mention we would love your input on, on the webinar, um, content, speaker ideas, if there is an approach uh, that you'd like to see us take on in these webinars. We're, we're trying out different ways of making it um, as, as interactive and exciting as, uh, as we can, um, and so your feedback is appreciated. We do have a good calendar coming up. I can tell you we've, uh, we've got the content in development for our webinar in August and then also in the fall. And we're also working on some in-person um, style events for CAFID members in the autumn as well. So please stay tuned to your emails. And as well, the CAFID members, many of you will have seen an email from Jesse Green, also on the Learning and Sharing Committee, uh, with a request for any inputs you would like to share in our, bi um, our bi-monthly CAFID newsletter. So if you've not had a chance yet, please do get back to Jesse with any news, updates, upcoming events, recent publications, et cetera, um, she would greatly appreciate your input. Um, and beyond that, stay tuned. Lots more to come for those who only got part of this. Um, this, this was recorded and will be available in the members section on the CAFID uh, website. And in addition to the thanks to our panelists, I think we can all um, offer a hearty thanks to Yana as well for terrific moderation and, and facilitation. Really appreciate it. Um, with that, I'll, I'll wish everyone a very nice day and, uh, and close out with thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.